Okay, so today I'm in London with uh, Jamie Hart, Racing and Liquidity Director at the Tote. Yeah. Thanks very much for agreeing to talk to us, Jamie. Um, now, well, you've told me a lot about yourself, so we'll sort of start with what you told me, but people don't know what you've told me, so yeah. I'll be leading, leading sort of questions. But one of the things you said, you've been a betting, in, you have a betting industry background, and we're gutted to see the Tote withering on the vine. Yeah, I think everybody that grew up in racing um, has a soft spot for the tote. I grew up in Newmarket, so I'd spent a lot of my time at the Rolling Mile and, and the July course, and the tote was a big part of that. The tote, obviously, it was, it was a better value tote in those days. There was a smaller takeout, just like with all of the totes, really, including Greyhounds. And if you go back to the early Greyhounds, I'm sure you talked to, I saw your interview with Harry, and that's right, you know, they used to be 6% takeout at White City, and you know, those kind of real big totes. And then you look around the world, and you've got the, you know, the Hong Kong Jockey Club, the, the tab out in Australia, that even though it's been competitive, you know, they've got new competition with fixed odds bookmakers in the last 25 years. It's still, uh, it's still a big tote, you know, PMU, it's a big tote, but um, it gives an alternative for punters, and I'm a punter myself. I've been a bookmaker most, most of my life, but you need that alternative. A strong tote is good for the environment, good for the ecosystem. I think, you know, so you've got a strong, a strong exchange, a strong tote, and a strong set of fixed odds bookmakers and the three support each other. And I think you'll see that internationally, but um, we were starting not to have that in this country. Um, certainly we, got a we had a strong I exchange and a, and a bunch of strong bookmakers, but the tote wasn't really seen as an option by serious punters, and we wanted to, or I wanted to be involved in changing that. You saw, you saw from afar that it was withering on the vine, yeah. as you say, but I mean, did, apart from the, the amount of money that was in it, did you yeah. see what was going wrong? I think, well, if you saw that the takeout rates were just going up rather than coming down, so while all the bookmakers were being more competitive, that we were all introducing best odds guaranteed and better, better terms, um, pricing to lower margins, the tote was going in the opposite direction. I just couldn't understand that. Uh, I think they were then just concentrating on being the on-course option for the, for the people that you know, couldn't be bothered to walk down to the bookies. And, th and it was just going to keep on getting worse because if you're not selling a betting product to a betting audience, then you you know it will wither on the vine. People that aren't interested in you, you can't s survive as a company selling to people that aren't interested in your product. And you you told me that you thought it'd be easy to turn around, but as yeah, a, yeah I thought what? it'd be simple. I thought I thought well, it's like everybody when you talk to any punter on the outside of the tote, you go well, you know, the tote's easy, isn't it? You just take, make it all three percent takeout and just let everyone bet. Um, and that's what I thought. I thought, brilliant, you could come in, and really it should be an alternative to the exchange. It should be that kind of level. And then it turns out there's lots of, uh, you know, because it, it was um, ex-government owned, and all of the totes tend to be, and all countries have government ownership at some point, and some kind of monopoly tote status, there tend to be a lot of regulations around that. So one of the things, we can't drop the takeout rate lower than 16% without full agreement from all the race courses and the race course groups. Um, we do that in a different way now by enhancing prices, certainly for, for the uh, people that bet with us directly. And that's how we get around that. But, um, but you've got a lot of stakeholders in here. Obviously, everybody that sells tote products, just like a lottery seller in the you know, news agent, the news agent gets his cut. It's the same with the tote. And so if we're gonna cut our takeout rates, everybody then thinks we'll hang about I'm, I'm getting a decent whack out of the place, but what, what, you, you're making, you're changing my income without talking to me. So we've we've tried to move it so that our most keenly priced area is if you bet directly with us, because we're not affecting anybody else's income that way, and we can test how price sensitive it is. But yeah, I, I've always thought though a global tote at three percent would would be an interesting introduction to the betting landscape. Okay, now you. You aren't a fan of the racing industry, and I would say, I'll tell people that are watching why, because you said to me, it's intent on shooting itself in the face at every opportunity it gets. That's quite strong. I, I, I think, uh, yeah, I th I, it's because I, I think for all the people that love racing so much and have, brought, have, have kind of brought themselves up with racing, it's been a massive hobby and a massive interest of mine. And I mean, I've genuinely, like, growing up in Newmarket, it's all around you. I think I, I didn't even realise that every town in the world wasn't like Newmarket until I was about nine or ten. I thought everywhere had loads of horses wandering about and built their year around, you know, the Guineas, the Derby and the St Ledger. But um, I, th I think it's because I love the product so much 
and I think and you, you look around the world and see how well it's doing in different areas. I think one of the areas where and there's many people have said it in the, in the UK particularly is just the, the difference in ownership across so many parts of it. So you've got a lot of competing factions. Um, most of the other areas where it's very healthy, the monopoly tote normally it was owned the media rights, and so you've always got that one big sell of this is everything. We put it to everybody and try and make our money from everyone being interested in it. I think certainly from working closer to racing with the with the tote as I have been. I mean, there's a loads of pockets of everybody's trying to do well in their area, but there's there's a lack of cohesion and a lack of overall vision for it. So you've got some areas that are trying to generate uh, betting shop kind of fodder. There's other areas where we're still trying to maintain a competitive group one structure, um, but we're suffering from that because all of the prize money isn't as good as the places where the uh, where all the media is owned by racing in in the sense. So. There's a, yeah, I think we don't we don't help ourselves. We could be helping each other out and looking at a longer term view a lot. And I think it's quite often we're fairly short term in racing. Yeah, well, I'm, I think you, I don't know whether I got you in a bad mood or not when, when we talked about this before. <laughs> but you said the problems with racing, entitlement, short termism, selfishness, and a lack of customer focus, and they're just yeah. the biggest challenges. Yeah, you're not a fan, are you? Really not. Well, I just <laughs> it's, it's because I am a fan that I get so frustrated. I think, yeah, an entitlement as though racing's going to be here forever. You know, oh, people will keep on coming to Ascot. People will keep, you know. I think as well, we, we were, you know, like chatting, we had some uh, uh, chats early on when we were raising funding for, for Alizetti and getting involved with people like Barry Hearn. And it, I think Barry, the great thing about Barry is he do, he's not entitled. He knows he has to work for everything. And he knows that, you know, if there's ever an, uh, an incident like a fight or something at a, at a darts event when there's so much drink and fun and it's that kind of environment then that would it'd be the end of it you know so he's he's absolutely on top of that you know so so he knows that he's you know he's only as lucky as he plans to to be you know it's because everything's planned that's why they don't have fights at the darts and it works it's very well secure uh, security focused and racing's kind of having a little bit of a problem with that um, there's another, you know, will we, uh, even um, World Pool Days with Hong Kong betting into the UK uh, for, you know, sharing their pools with the UK and the UK race courses, getting money out of that. Now, we do have the bet, you know, out of all the group, we have more group one races than anybody else, of the, all the kind of top races in the world, but that is changing. You know, the, there's, there's a lot more competition now. With money in France, you've got, all these new races coming up here in, in the middle, you know, in Saudi Arabia as well, coming in alongside Dubai. You've got Australia pumping more money into it. There's, you know, there's not enough horses to go around and there's plenty of big meetings and uh, places like Hong Kong make plenty of money serving South African race, the two big South African days. They took more money than, the, than half of our UK days. So we can't sit on our laurels and just assume we're always gonna be getting interest around some of our big days. And, I think that's what I, that's that sense of entitlement. I think we should be very wary of. Do you think that tote betting just is it in our blood? It's hard. I think we certainly certainly people love taking a prize, and I think that's part of it. So you, you whenever we're talking about uh, betting in this country, there's much more focus on picking a winner. If you look into other countries, if you go to Australia, if you go to Hong Kong and watch the TV coverage, you ask a tipster for their view on race three, and they'll give you their, their three to bot. They'll go four with the two and six, or the, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll talk about the exotics. We definitely don't do it. We always just want to know your tip, you know, your one horse. And I think that's something we, we need to do more of. I think it's much harder now without uh, flexi betting they have in Australia, where uh, you just say, right, I want to try a factor to the first three in the right order, but I want one, five, seven, nine, and 10 for $10 and you pay $10. And I think that, that you know, if you've ever served somebody in the tote, in, you know, at a big meeting like at Ladies Day or something like that at, at Aintree, you know, when somebody calls out seven horses and wants the first three and they sell it, they go, yeah, that's, you know, and they're, suddenly they want, they're, they're told it's gonna cost them more than 300 quid and they've got a fiver. It's, 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 it's hard to get that across to people because it's not in the psyche. Of, of the British punter, we are very bookmaker based. But I think 
we, as, as it'll start from the more serious pundits working its way down now, I think, and that's what we're trying to do with the tote here, is just introduce, the, there is proper value, particularly around the whirlpool days, with the exotics, to get people looking into those kind of pools, where they're million pound pools because the Hong Kong guys are betting in, there's proper value there, to, you know, real value in those. So start to get the bigger kind of respected players playing into the tote and, and then it, it does eventually feed through because people they respect to playing into the tote. I know you've checked to mm. Harry and Patrick and those kind of guys that, that take, you know, they're betting very seriously and of course the tote has to be part of the board. Well it's a scoop six. Really. Yeah, the scoop they, they six were particularly. The, the big fit and friends of mine were in, you know, we sort of run a syndicate and I think there's a lot of that, and that but even though the big players are involved that also caught the attention of the small people. Yeah. The the lady that won with the two quid, you know, and got the front yeah. page of the sun, that sort of thing. So Agnes is Haddock. yes. You know, is that is that first and foremost, are you gonna get the scoop six back to its former glory? It's gonna be very difficult. Um, the scoop six when it was at its peak was the main bet that was talked about on terrestrial T V coverage. So, you know, with Channel Four. Um, T V coverage has got far more commercial these days. Yeah, for anything if you want to have a, uh, a, a kind of platinum relationship with ITV Racing. I think it's been published what, what those kind of, so, but it's multi millions of pounds to, to do that. And then you're only really getting the bumpers in the adverts. You know, you, don't, you still can't really influ you can't influence to any degree the, um, the editorial content. Um, whereas in the past, you know, the Scoop Six got a lot of coverage. So it's, so, and it was a time when the lottery was also kind of just coming through. It was, you know, um, so I don't think we'll ever get that kind of coverage again. Um, and then it was, it, was, it was a certain group of people that kept on winning it. We didn't have enough of the Agnes Haddocks in there. So that, you know, it, and, and you do get um, losers fatigue from the masses and when they're playing their two quid every, and they're never getting anywhere. We do have the place part. That's the other thing mm. with the scoop six. When you talk to people these days that do remember, half of the people that I talk to don't know that there's a place part of the scoop six. You know, So that was always the big kind of consolation in there that mean, meant you could perm up a bit because you could rely on getting some of that place part back. But I think it's going to be harder. We're going to, for something that size, I think it's going to come from a co-mingled international bet where you do use Liquidity from Hong Kong and other totes, and you all have, and you're all sharing in that same bet. And it could that could be a football bet or it could be a racing bet. I hope it, you know, but we'd certainly want to be in the centre of that and an outlet for that for the UK. But I think it's going to take international money to generate the kind of levels of turnover that that we'd need for a really big headline. Okay, then we talk, we've talked about the world. Well, we haven't really talked about the world yet, but we've everybody's probably heard about it. And there's certain yeah. big meetings. Is there a possibility that uh, ex, uh, uh, race at Exeter in you know, in the future is going to be all part of the world pool. Is that can that cover everything? Is that the ambition? It, not in its current guise, um, but I think I think that's cer that's certainly the long term goal. So the world pool itself is a Hong Kong racing initiative. They're limited by their government of how many international co mingling days they can have. So they they constantly lobby to have more. Um, so th so the, in its current guise, that we are we are limited on the in number that that Hong Kong. Can host and Hong Kong's got most of the money in there, so they they host those. I think when you look at the World Tote Association, the whole drive behind that and behind the members of the World Tote Association and where we're trying to get to long term is the fact that we're running B, we we call them A pools and B pools. So if Australia are running a pool, a pool at uh, Flemington, that's the A pool. It's the pool that is of the kind of country it comes from. If if Paris if, if France are running a B pool, a pool on that race but they're running themselves as a B pool. There's too many B pools around whereas if we put all of the money into one pool so every time there's a race in France we're all playing into that. If it's in Britain we're all playing into that. If it's in Australia we're all playing into that. That's where we want to get to. It won't, I th we're hoping that will just become business as usual. So it will be outside the whirlpool model but that's certainly where we need to get to to have proper, proper uh, pools across the board.